shift gears a little bit and talk about how do we cope with all this? How do we cope with trauma-related problems? And you know, I, I'm not here to say that they, that I have all the answers and that we should do everything that I say. And it's for that it's easy at all. But these are just some strategies that I think target many of the problems that I just talked about. First, we need to speak out and, and reach out to others. We need to make sure that we are not afraid to express our feelings. Um, obviously, it's a recipe for depression, for anger, for PTSD, when we hold in our feelings, when we avoid talking about what's going on with us. That's a main contributor to all of the problems that I just described, all the psychiatric problems that, that are related to trauma. We have to, we have to talk about our feelings to others in, in any way that we possibly can. We also need to label violence and abuse. We need to be aware of violence and abuse when it's happening. So for example, psychological abuse. When somebody's being abusive to you, it's really helpful for you to recognize, you know, this is abusive, this is not okay, and, and I'm not gonna let you do this, right? So we have to know what, what abuse looks like and recognize violence and abuse so we can do something about it and, and minimize our exposure to that. We need to seek out others to talk to. Uh, as animal advocates, I think it's really critical that we talk to other animal advocates about what, what we're exposed to, what we're doing, what our struggles are. I know I have one or two other advocates I try to talk to once a week if I can, and that's really important. You know, just like we as clinical psychologists know the importance of talking to our co-therapists about, about our groups. It's the same thing, because we don't want to develop vicarious traumatization, we don't want to develop problems just from hearing story after story of violence and abuse. Same thing in animal advocacy, when we are exposed to all the different forms of trauma that I talked about at the very beginning, it's really important to seek out other like-minded folks and talk about this stuff with them. Let me just, uh, let me just spontaneously ask you all as a group, how many of you make a point of this, of reaching out to other animal advocates and talking about things that you're dealing with? Okay, so a lot of you do. How many of you feel like you could probably do more of that? Okay, so, so most of you feel that way. I, I, think this, I do think this is really important. Seek qualified professional help if, if you need to. And I'm not saying if you all need to go and see psychologists, you know, that's all up to you, you know, what, what you need help with. What I will say, though, is that if you feel like you're suffering from trauma and PTSD, then, then you should seek help. And if anybody tries to minimize what you're saying and tries to tell you, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, you're experiencing PTSD because of animal advocacy or because of violence to non-human animals, if a therapist suggests anything like that, go find a new therapist, right? I, I hear a lot of really bad, you know, really terrible stories from folks who seek psychologists or seek therapists, and the therapist is, is really um, invalidating of their experiences. So find somebody who will really listen to you and validate the trauma, the negative experiences that, that you're describing to them. If they, if they start to talk to you like, you're, you know, you being vegan, you know, it's like having an eating disorder or, you're, or anything like that, just like leave that therapist and find somebody else, right? Because a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of therapists, a lot of clinicians don't understand animal advocacy. They don't understand veganism, just like the general population doesn't. So find somebody that really understands and really will listen to you. And I talked about know that your experiences are, are valid and refuse to be silenced by others. There's a whole lot of people that would love all of us just to shut the heck up, right? <laughs> um, probably many of our loved ones, a whole lot of people online, I, I've run across many of them, would love us to be quiet about, you know, to stop, to stop speaking about, out about the trauma that non-human animals are experiencing. And some would like us to stop talking about our, our own trauma reactions as well. We, and we have to really be careful not to silence ourselves. Set limits and boundaries. This is really important for whatever you're, whatever you're doing. And this is something, and this is a really important part of being assertive. So finding that middle path between being overly passive and keeping everything in and being overly aggressive with other people is being assertive. And part of being assertive is to let other people know what your limits are, what your boundaries are. So if you feel like somebody's being abusive to you, if somebody's exposing you to trauma that you don't need to be exposed to, let them know or get away from that person or unfriend them on Facebook or whatever it is that you need to do to minimize your, your exposure to trauma and negativity if you feel like it's not good for you. And oftentimes people ask me questions like, 
you know, should I go to this event where folks are going to be eating animals, or should I not? Or um, what should I do about my family member who, you know, eats animals and teases me about it, or, or, or what have you? And, you know, there's, there's really no set answer for any of this, because it's all up to you what your limits are, what's good for you, what isn't good for you. So you all need to be sure about and think about where your limits and boundaries are with other people. One thing um, that I find to be really helpful is to use what's called I statements. So I statements is just you saying how you feel. So I feel hurt because you did this, or I feel upset. Or it can involve you telling your own story, your own animal advocacy story. You know, I, I'm vegan because I just, I, I realized that, I, I, at some point I realized that I just could not justify contributing to the needless killing of animals anymore. The more that we talk from our own perspective, the, the more likely, it's, more likely others will listen to what you have to say. The, the, uh, the opposite of an I statement is a you statement. So if you say you need to stop doing this or you need to do that or you're murdering animals or, or whatever it is, you're going to get a much more defensive, a much more hostile reaction and a lot more exposure to violence and, and trauma if, if that's the way you're going to go about your interactions with other people. Don't internalize harmful, mes uh, harmful messages. That may be easier said than done, but really try to do work in that area. Well, again, don't engage in negative self-talk when other people are telling you that you're worthless, or telling you you're stupid, telling you you're this or that. Just, just be mindful that this is their trauma, this is their stuff, and this isn't about you at all. This is about them, and this is their problem. This doesn't say anything about who you are as a person. Don't internalize any of that. This is them, it's not you. We all help create our own social world, and this is why events like this are so important. I think it's really important to be around like-minded people, people we can talk to, people we can relate to. So do whatever you need to do to feel like you're comfortable in your own circle, in your own world, as much as, much as you possibly can. And of course, you know, self-care. It's kind of cliche to say we need to engage in self-care, but we really do. And um, I'm sure if I ask, you know, show of hands, how many of you could do better at, and, well, let me ask you, how many of you could do better at self-care? Raise your hand. So pretty much everybody. <laughs> I know, I know I could, I could as well. So we, we really do need to be mindful of kind of where we're at in terms of our exposure to violence and trauma. We need to take, we need to take good care of ourselves. We need to take breaks from trauma, from violence. We need to do whatever, whatever we can to make sure that we're going back into things kind of in, in in a healthy way, as, as healthy as we possibly can. So I want to talk a little bit about, about our thoughts, uh, because really our thoughts are what kind of fuel just about everything. Our thoughts are what often fuel our problems with anger, our depression, our PTSD. All of these things are fueled by our thoughts. Again, I think it's really important to avoid that misanthropic worldview for reasons that I talked about. As you can tell, I really, did, I really have a problem with misanthropy. I think, I think it's a big issue because I feel like there are many animal advocates out there who have this more misanthropic kind of stance, and, I, and, I, and then I'm concerned because a lot of young animal advocates kind of have that misanthropic point of view, and I, and I do think it's harmful not only, not only for their advocacy but for themselves as well. Try to recognize your negative thought patterns and replace them with more positive thoughts. Again, that's something that I know it sounds easier to say than done. Oh yeah, sure, I'll just recognize my negative thoughts and think positively. I don't expect you all to be going around kind of thinking the world is sunshine and rainbows, right? Because obviously there's a lot of horrible things out there, all the trauma and violence that we're exposed to on a daily basis that I talked about at the beginning. But as much as you can, try to catch yourself when you're kind of negatively interpreting other people, when, you're, when your thoughts are starting to race in a negative direction, when you're assuming the worst in other people. Try to catch yourself doing that and try to not either not assume anything in other people or, or assume the best if you have to assume something. Give others the benefit of a doubt, and don't assume others' intentions. And lastly, you know, we can feel pride and satisfaction from, from doing good. So we should be telling ourselves that, you know, that we're doing the best that we can, that we're trying to you know, make a change in the world, and let ourselves feel good about our advocacy and what we're doing to try to prevent and try to reduce violence and trauma that are out there. You know, one really good way to prevent depression is to help others. And that's something that I really found out early on in my career as a psychologist, actually as a grad student. The more that I devoted my energies to try to improve the, the human condition, 
The more I focus on other people rather than myself, the less depressed I, I would feel. And I, I am sure I would be severely depressed if I didn't do any work in violence prevention, if I didn't do animal advocacy. So I think it's, it's really important for us to feel good about the advocacy that we're doing and to try to do as much of it as, as we can. Just some other tips for coping with anger and depression. Remember that anger is the easiest emotion to express. It's not hard to just say, you know, I hate, I hate you, I hate everybody. It's not hard to be misanthropic, right? Uh, just to say, I don't, I don't care about you. That, that's probably the easiest thing you can do. But there's almost always other feelings that are underneath the anger. There's almost always feelings of hurt, of sadness, of shame, of frustration. And those are really the feelings that are most important to get out to express to that other person. Those underlying feelings are really at the heart of a lot of the difficulties we experience from all the trauma that, that, that we're exposed to. So we want to develop an awareness of those underlying feelings as much as we can, try to recognize what it is we're feeling uh, in addition to the anger. In the work that I do, a lot of folks I work with will describe having difficulty expressing feelings because they feel like it's a sign of weakness somehow, that they're making themselves vulnerable, um, and that, that they're being weak because they're kind of expressing vulnerable feelings. But really, what I, what I tell them, and what I'll tell you all, is that it's really just the opposite of that. It really takes a lot of strength to, to express those softer emotions to other people. To let, to let other people know that you're really having a tough time or you're feeling sad or you're feeling hurt. To really put yourself out there and make yourself vulnerable takes courage. Um, to, to, it takes courage. So um, I encourage you to kind of <coughs> avoid any kinds of thoughts that, you know, I'm any less of a person or any less, or like a lot of men do this way. I'm less of a man if I express my feelings. Okay, so lastly, I want to try to end on, on a bit of a positive note. Uh, post-traumatic growth. How many of you have heard of, of post-traumatic growth before? Raise your hand. Okay, so a handful of you. You're probably clinicians or, or, uh, or in the helping field in some way. Uh, so the idea of post-traumatic growth, these are the conditions. Someone experiences trauma that seriously challenges their core beliefs, their beliefs about the world. They endure major psychological struggle, struggle that may include PTSD or mental illness, and the person ultimately finds a sense of personal growth. So I, I want to end with this because I don't want to I don't want to describe trauma as necessarily debilitating and necessarily leading to PTSD and all the problems. It may lead to those problems, but you may also grow from the experience. I know a lot of you know really amazing activists that I know have experienced trauma and it's and it's fueled their passion and it's really um, I think kind of, it's really broadened their sense of compassion, their sense of uh, mission and purpose, and their, their focus. So I don't want to say, you know, trauma is always going to just only lead to negative things. There's also a growth aspect of it. That if we're able to work through it, if we're able to overcome it, if we're able to talk about it with other people, uh, the trauma will never, the trauma will never go away. But you may get to a point someday where you can look back and really feel proud about you know how, how far you've how much you've grown from it, how far you've come from from when you first experienced the trauma. And that's that's it. Thank you.